All right, hey, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 14, but I'm going to take a minute to get there, all right, just so you know. We're wandering through the book, and, and Joshua, and I'm going to remind you again, when we look at the Old Testament, you don't just get to make it say whatever you want it to say. That's how a lot of people will teach it. It's not just random thoughts that you can just attach your own to. Paul told us that the, the, the things that were written for us of old were written uh, to teach us, to, to show us how we ought to live. That's what they're for. And so we need to understand what's going on in the context of the book of Joshua so that we can then pull out those applications because they teach us how to live. And there's great stories in this book as well. And so today uh, we're going to look at, at Caleb. He's going to be a piece of it, but I want to bring us to the, to the place where we talk about. So this is the story. You remember God's people whom he had promised to Abraham were going to be a great nation. They, they became that, but it took a season. And then Egypt, because where they ended up because of Joseph, so that they wouldn't starve, he, he sent Joseph ahead of them into Egypt. And, and, and long story short of that whole thing of just journeying through the ups and downs of life, right? Uh, like one of the lines in the songs we sang, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That was Joseph telling his brothers that because uh, they... They were brutal to him, but he ended up in the place, the exact place God needed him for him to be so that a famine wouldn't destroy the world. And so he brought his family there. Well, then another Pharaoh came along, and, and Israel is bigger and bigger because they know how to have babies, and so there's plenty of them. And that Pharaoh says, we need to put them in bondage or they're going to out outnumber us, and we won't even have a chance. And so they did that. And so we saw that in, in the book of Exodus, right? That they're in there. And we saw God deliver them out of that. And they could have gone right into the promised land, except they lacked the faith to do so. And so they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And at the end of that 40 years, Joshua, who was a, a younger man, but who was an understudy of Moses, used to spend a lot of time at what was called the tent of meeting. So Moses would go and connect with God in the tent. That's before he dwelt among us and now dwells in us. This was so he was this how God has operated. And so Moses would go and speak with him in the tent of meeting, and the people had questions, they could deal with them there. Well, when Moses left, Joshua would just hang out there and just spend time with the Lord. Because God was grooming him to be the warrior that would allow them to conquer the holy land, the promised land that they had had. So this is what this book is about. And so it starts off, uh, and I'm going to review real quickly, but it starts off, right, uh, that there's a battle for our soul. They were battling the promised land. That was their blessing, the land, the seed, and the blessing. And it was theirs, but there was enemies residing in it, right? And so they had to be conquered in order to live in that land full fruit of what was meant to be for them. They had to conquer the enemy. Well, it translates to you and to me that we too have been given a new heart, right? When we came to Christ, He gave us, He removed that heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh. That's how, that's how Jeremiah says it. And so He has resided in our heart. But we also know that our own flesh is in there, isn't it? And so we too have a battle to face. I have to rid myself I have to, this is now, my heart now belongs to the Lord, but there's an enemy in there. It's called the flesh, and the world has a say in it, and the devil has a say in it, right? Those are the three things we fight. My job is to put a chokehold on all of those so that I can live abundantly in this land by the Spirit of Christ and enjoy it. That, that makes sense. This is exactly what the picture of this is. So we see this, and we pull these examples out. So having said that, uh, there's a battle for our soul. And just like there was for Joshua. And you remember what he, God says to Joshua? Moses, your servant is dead. Now get up. It's time to go, right? Let's take charge. Let's, let's get after it. And so he said this, I am for you. These were the things that we need to remember. God, and so if you're a believer in Christ today, listen, God is for you. I had a man ask me today, what's, or this week, what was more important than believing in God? And he said, and I said, well, I think that's about it. And he said, nope, it's God believing in you. And I didn't want to argue with the man because I never met the man, but I'm like, you know what? God doesn't believe in me. I mean, he believes I'm real, but he doesn't believe in me, right? He knows I'm a dirty, rotten, stinking little sinner, right? He, he knows we have dark, wicked hearts. I didn't want to have that theological discussion with that man, but that was wrong. So he, But he is for us, right? 
And so it's important that you and me know that. He is for us as believers in Christ. Listen, before we came to Christ, I'm on the opposite side. His wrath is being stored up for those who don't know Him. And we forget that. But when He presented Himself to me, and He gave me the faith to believe Him, and I confessed my sins, and I repented of those, and I invited Him to have His way in my life, I found myself on His side. And so He's for me. And He will always be for me, because when He brings you to His side, He neither leaves you nor forsakes you, and those who are His can't go nowhere anyway. Right? And so that's what we call eternal security in that sense. And so this is where I am. And then he told, he told Joshua this. He says, I want you to be, to be strong and courageous. Right? And I want you to be consumed with my word. Don't depart from it, neither to the right nor to the left. Do everything I say. No compromise. I need you to destroy everything in there. Don't you, don't you, don't you let something scoot by there. Don't you settle for close or good enough. Now I'm rephrasing those phrases, but that's what he said. And then, then they spot out Rahab, right? And Rahab's that picture that God redeems people uh, through faith no matter where they are, right? She grew up, I mean, how would you like to be known forever as, you know, so-and-so the prostitute or so-and-so the jerk or so-and-so the bum, right? Her, her name is always seen as Rahab the harlot. Yet in the midst of all of that, God looked into that city that was mighty and wicked. And some that one. That one. I'm going to send you to her house because I want her to tell you what she thinks about your God so that you will tell her about your God and that she will repent of those things. And we find her in the in the book of Hebrews in the Faith Hall of Fame. By faith, Rahab did she lied and sent the, the, the her uh her the, the enemy the wrong way, right? This is who she, this is who God is. And then they stepped into their blessing. They had to cross. Now they, she came back, and they came back. The spies did and said, hey, we can, Jericho's there. It's big, but here's what's going on. And then, they, then that was when they crossed that Jordan, right? And so we saw that the steps to blessing starts with just stepping. We just have to step. We have to cross the Jordan. We have to make our decision. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in, in, in heaven, right? You, you can't. You have to choose. And so for them, it was, and, and we, we, I don't want to rehash that, but that, that was when Jordan was at its banks and its highest. That means you didn't just tippy-toe into the water. You, you fell in, and if that water didn't part, you're going under. And if you're carrying the ark like those priests were, you're going really deep, right? Because it was heavy and full of gold, uh, or, or, and laden with gold. But before they stepped, he said, I need you to sanctify yourself. I want you to just look at yourself. I want you to cleanse your sins. I want you to confess them to me. I want these things happening. See, this is why this is a part of our life as we go through life. And then, and then as we step, we just expect God's going to move, right? He didn't part the water until they put their foot in. You understood that, right? It wasn't like he said, just, you stand real close, I will. He did that with Moses. But here's different, right? With Moses, he said, hey, son, if you'll just stand still, shut up, and hold that staff that way, I'll let you see salvation. Not so with these guys. It's like, hey, let's take a step first. And so that God expects us to move. Well, then we got to Jericho. We learned that God is with us, and God's strategy isn't always our strategy. So we, some trust in chariots and some in horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God, right? The weapons that we, that we deal with aren't normal weapons, but ours are spiritual and mighty, right? And so that's what he was demonstrating to them. And then we saw that they decided to go into battle against Ai and... Uh, and they didn't need to take the whole crowd because it was a small thing compared to Jericho. And they came home with their tail between their legs, so to speak, because there was sin in the camp. And we realized that God does not tolerate sin in the camp. And Ai had taken, or, or Achan rather, had taken some of the gold which God said, I don't want you to take anything from them. You know why he did that? Because the first fruits belonged to him. And every other, every other place they conquered, they took the stuff, but not the first place because that belongs to the Lord. And they stole from God. That's how he saw it. And so... Achan passed away, and, and he and his family. Uh, and so we saw that you can't have sin in the camp. You can't tolerate, not, not a little, not just, well, I mean, it just looks so pretty. I just, I'm like, I just want to hold it. No. No small thing, no such thing as a small disobedience. Man, then they were deceived, right? Gibeon, the enemy that they were told to swear to have nothing to do with, came and pretended that they came from a faraway country and they got them to make a treaty. And now they had to deal with something because they compromised. They weren't careful in what that they, they just weren't careful in what they did. 
Um, and they, they didn't, you know one of the one things it says there? They did not pray and consult the Lord about that decision. And every time we jump into something, we ought to pray and consult mm-hmm. the Lord about what that is, right? So, now, now we're getting there. We've all seen it. We saw all that. Uh, I think, did we? Oh, oh, the sun stands still. No, we missed that part too. After, um, uh, so after they deceived Gibeon, then there's seven other, ki- five other kings that decide to make an alliance. And God says, listen, you got this thing. Take off. Take care of these people. And sh- and so they do. And Joshua is, is seeing victory, but the, the time is, is, the sun's going down. He's like, I got to finish this. And so he makes that incredible, in- incredible prayer. God, I need you to make the sun stand still. Right? I mean, you think your prayers are big. They ain't much bigger than that one, right? I mean, that, you think about what happened uh, scientifically for the sun to stand still. I, I don't know if that meant the, our earth quit rotate. I, don't, I can't think to the depth that I guess it has to, but like I would assume we'd all fly off of this place, but we didn't. Now, all of that stuff. And what do you do when the sun stands still? Does it not mess up the whole calendar thing? What's, what's going to go there? All of those things. But here's the thing. Listen, when you're pursuing the enemy of your soul, you ask God for big things, right? And you expect that He'll do those things. And never underestimate the power of your prayers. So then chapter 11, 12, and 13, which I'm just going to give to you real quick, is just the story of how the northern area of Canaan has been conquered. Moses had, had uh, destroyed three kings and kingdoms on this side of the Jordan, and Joshua, at this point now, has destroyed 31 kings and kingdoms. That, that's how many they've conquered in, in that area. Now, Cain is divided, and he's starting to separate the spools to the 12 tribes. All right, that's about as fast as I know how to review. Here we are, chapter 14. Good. We're going to look at a man named Caleb today. Caleb. His name means dog clan. Strange, right? He comes from the clan of dogs. Or forcible is another way they use that term. But when you think about it, you think of dog life. Are you familiar with Caleb? If you're not, I'll just hang on. But let me just tell you, that name comes because the dog-like qualities are two things, really. If you've if you got a bulldog, what's that dog-like quality? They don't ever quit, do they? They just persevere, right? They just per- They will hold on, and they will, they will not unclench. And they will wear you out, and then they'll dominate you. They're just that dog. And the other is that they're loyal, right? They just, again, they're, they persevere and they're loyal. There's no quit in them. And so like the German Shepherd, right? It's just, it's just loyal. So we get to chapter 14. Um, let me get to it. We'll start reading, and then I want to make some comments. It says, uh, so he's conquered all the territories. Um, and we get to verse 6, all right? So he's divided the land. Now there's a conversation that's going to take place, and I want us to see it. Then the sons of Judah approached Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You remember Caleb and Joshua were buddies way back? Right? They were the two spies that actually said, Hey, we got this thing. Right? And so now Joshua, who's the commander, and Caleb's just an old man in the, in the deal, uh, stands up and look. And so he and his crowd, because he's from the line of Judah, and they're, they're, they're kind of handing out who, who's going to live where. This is the conversation. This is what Caleb says. You know the word of the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, on account of you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought word back to him as it was in my heart, right? He said, I mean, I saw what everybody else saw, but I brought back what was in my heart. Uh, Nevertheless, my brothers who went out with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. Mark that down. That separates. That separates the average believer from the believer, the real believer, is that he follows God fully. When I was growing up, my mom and dad drug us to Keswick. It was an old school camp meeting. It happened every year downtown Birmingham. And a man named Stephen Olford would come every year. And the only reason he was interesting to me because he spoke with a British accent and, you know, you can't help but listen to a guy that speaks with a British accent. But I remember sitting there with my friend Kathy because we would sit together. We were the same age, and we were probably, you know, 11, 12, 14 years old in that range. But I remember this man saying this, if Christ isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. 
And as a 12 year old kid wanting to scribble on a bulletin instead of pay attention, I can hear that man. In, when I say those words, I hear it in a British accent because it marked my life. And I saw my mom and dad make that decision. And I saw what it cost my mom and dad when they did that. But my mom and dad were all in. You know what I mean by that? We, we weren't casual Christian. My mom and dad were all in. The, the, the lady you know to be my mom didn't take a back seat to my dad. My dad was just like her. If, you, if you'd known my dad, he was just like her. And they taught me to live by that principle that he has to be Lord of all. And this is exactly what it's saying here about Caleb. Caleb's going, hey man, I, but I followed God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, the land of which your feet has walked shall certainly be an inheritance to you and to your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God fully. He said, listen, Joshua, Moses told me I'm going to get this land because I followed God fully. I want you to hear this. This isn't up for discussion. You don't get to go, well, I know Moses said that, but I think you'd like this place better. Don't do that to me. Mm -mm, that's not happening. This is what God said through Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me. Now, that sounds a lot like the verse that came here. Right? Those that wait on the Lord. That's why we sang that song. <laughs> i got to imagine, Caleb, if he's not slapping the ten who said no... Or I would be doing that every day. I'd wake up, find him, and just slap him. Just say, man, for 40 years, you're drugging me around here like this. You know, you're the reason. But, but he stayed faithful. And you know what was happening when he, when he was doing that? His strength was being renewed. That's why an 85-year-old man can go, hey, listen. I'm as strong today as I was at 40. Don't, don't tell me I can't have that mountain. This is powerful, right? See, look, the outward body's decaying, but the inward's not, Right? I'd like to think that Miss Faye and Margaret and some of these other folks that have been here a little longer than us, right, Miss Virginia, I'm not trying to pick on all the old folk. I'm just reminding, right, that, that I bet you're as strong inwardly or more so today than you ever were, even though your body may be, may be wearing out, right? And that's the way it is here. And he's like, I got this. Now listen to what he says. From the time the Lord spoke to the word of Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now. For war and for going out and coming in, he said, I can still fight. That's a crusty old man, right? Now, then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there. See, we think that David was the giant killer. He didn't hold a candle to Caleb. Caleb went into the land of giants. The I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and give you the, the clue. The Bible will record that all of the Anakim died except for those that, that came from Gath. You know who, where Goliath came from? Gath. I think Caleb just said, I'm going to leave a few for King David just so he can have something to do, right? But I mean, listen, Caleb was a giant slayer before anybody wanted to call... Uh, Call David that. And sometimes we forget that. Don't despise those old folk. They know what they're doing. They can teach you a few things. And it says this, Now then give me that hill, right? Which God, with, with great fortified cities, prepare, perhaps the Lord will be with me. Did you hear that? Perhaps the Lord... Listen, I love the humility of that man. Because he knows that God promised him that. But still at the same time, he's not going, hey, I got it. He's not, he just said, look, I'm as strong as I was. Perhaps the Lord will. That's great humility. If the Lord wills, right? Yeah. That's, isn't that Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Yeah. Hey, I ain't bowing down. My God will deliver me. But on second thought, you know what? And if he doesn't, I'm still not bowing down, right? This is Caleb. It's that spirit of humility that says, no, you know what? I'm, I'm going to walk. I'm, by faith, I'm going to take that land. But it's up to the Lord whether I get it. I will drive them out just as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Now the name of Hebron was previously Kiria Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land was at rest from war. He, he didn't... He didn't just kill one of the giants. You understand the Anakim or giants? I'm not going to go into all the history of Israel, but 
But this was the strongest. He went into the strongest, most fortified land of the giants. And when he was done, there weren't there anymore. He owned the whole thing. What do we learn from that? Full devotion to God. That's what we learn. Full devotion to God. I'm not going to take us through Numbers 13, although it speaks uh, about that. If you want to mark that, you can, um, because it kind of goes back to that time when when Moses makes that commitment and says, hey, I'm going to give this to you, uh, and calls him, uh, he, he says he had a different spirit. That's how Moses says. But, but Caleb had a different spirit, for he followed God fully. I, I want to have a different spirit, don't you? I, I, look, I don't want to be marginal. I, I, don't, I don't want to be. I want to be as hot as I can be for God. And I say that now, and those of you who know me know that sometimes I, I'm not... <laughs> And you know that I can I can do things I shouldn't do, but I'm telling you this is this is this is true. This is this has to be true of all of us. God wants our whole heart. This is the issue. This is what it comes down to, right? I have a responsibility to conquer my heart, right? I can't do anything about yours, right? I mean, I can speak the truth. But I'm responsible for my heart. I'm not responsible for what you do, but I am responsible for mine. And I can't hold a little bit of sin in my heart. I can't hold a little bit of unforgiveness. I can't hold a little bit of unfaithfulness. If it's His, it's His. And whatever He wants to do there, He does there. You and me understand that the Spirit can't produce the fruit that He wants in our life unless we put a chokehold on on sin, right? That is why you and me have to put off the old man. He crucified, the, the old man has no power anymore, right? The Bible says reckon him as dead to sin. But we can give him that. And so my job is to put to death the deeds of the flesh. To put off the old man. Why? Because it's being corrupted by its deceitful desires. What am I going to do? Be made new in the attitude of my mind. And then what am I going to do? Put on the true self. Right? The true man. Who's meant to be holy and faithful and righteous. This is, this is what we do. And this is exactly what we're seeing play here. Full devotion to God. I think that's why Jesus says in some of his statements, unless you hate mother, father, brother, sister, you can have no part of me. He's not saying that we ought to go around hating our family. He's saying, listen, that can't be more important to me. I want your whole heart. I don't want you. I love your family. I want your whole heart. Right? I think that's why he says that to the rich young ruler, hey, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Why? Because I don't want you half-hearted. I don't want you coming as long as you can take your money. I want to know if you come if, I, if you can't keep your money. That's why he says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He means those words. I think we act like he does it. I, I know sometimes I, I, I feel good. Okay, I'm, I did pretty good today. The, the goal isn't pretty good. The goal is that I wake up every day and I put a chokehold on the old flesh and I drop it down and I say, not today. And I live my life. I wake up the next morning and I do the same thing again, right? This is what it means to be a Christ follower. And I, the reason why I think our country is the way it is because there are very few who are actually doing that today, right? And you and me can be those people. You know what flows when you're fully devoted? When you're all in? Faith. That's what flows. And that's what happened there in, in verse 10 and 12 of, uh, of Joshua 14. He's like, hey, I got it. I have no doubt that that's going on, right? It, it was said of Abraham, uh, let me see if I can find that one real quick, uh, in, in Romans chapter 12. But since, uh, nope, that's the wrong one. Sorry. All this tech stuff, I, I should just get my old Bible out. I know, I know, but I can't see it anymore. Um, I know, I know. Now my whole Bible is not working. My whole Bible is not working right right now anyway, so we're going to keep working. Um, Peter talks about that how God has granted to us His great and precious promises to those of us who have faith to believe. And so the whole concept is about faith. Abraham's faith was such that he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So when you and I are all in, there's a faith that comes in. And that brings hope. Let's just, let me just run some questions by you.
you believe in the promises of God. I know we all say we do. So most of us have a little, most of us have a little promise book, right? But do you believe that? Do you believe that God's grace is sufficient for you? Right? Sometimes we just scoot the hard stuff because we don't believe that. We say we do, but then we run from the hard stuff. Right? Sometimes it's hard to separate ourselves from from those things of the world. Right? But God's grace is sufficient. You believe if you seek first the kingdom, then all the things that he spoke of will come unto us? And all those things were physical necessities. Do you believe that? If we seek his kingdom, will he give us those things? Do we believe like he said to the, to, in Malachi, test me now in this and see if I won't open up the windows and pour out on you a blessing? Do we believe that if we, if we trust God with our money? That's not just in the plea for the church. I think y'all know that. We don't do that here. But, but this is that generosity. Do you, do you believe that? You believe that, that you can't outgive God in that sense, and so let's don't be stingy with the things that God gives to us. And do we believe that all things work together for good, that, that there's those that love God and are called according to His purpose? Does that belief affect your conduct? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. See, Caleb didn't minimize the problem, he just magnified God. Right? Isn't that right? He didn't, he didn't go, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. No, no. He saw the same thing everybody else did. He didn't minimize that problem. What did he do? I magnify God. My God is bigger than that. Right? Well, if we were to keep working through that scripture, we would see that strength flows from faith. That's what happens. Right? When you put your faith in Him and you start walking, there's a strength. That, that's exactly what Isaiah 40 speaks of. The second Corinthians, which you mentioned earlier. Though the outward man be decaying, inwardly he's being renewed day by day. One thousand, I mean, uh, 16,200 days Moses walked that land, uh, the, the wilderness, before he got to see his land. All he did was make him stronger, didn't it? See, sometimes the difficulties, we wonder, why, why, God, did you send me through this, right? Like Joseph. Joseph, wait, why did I get thrown in the pit? Wait, why did I get accused of sexual harassment? Why not get forgotten in prison? Because God's working us through. And God knows that it's those difficult days that come in our life and how we respond to that it is really what grows us. Right? Yeah. And so we don't run from the difficult days. We just trust Him in the middle of those. The yeah, fourth one. How we respond is more important than the actual thing that we're going through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so then the last thing we, we look at is that victory comes from strength, right? What, what happened? Well, he, he cleared the whole land out. There are no giants in that land anymore. The only ones that were left were in Gath. And that's not his territory. That was, that was the Philistine territory. So a complete victory requires complete devotion. That's why you hear men like Paul say, I buffet my body not to make it my slave, right? Or I take every thought captive. Do you hear these terms? that we take for granted in the Scriptures, what is that? That's a man who was fully devoted to God, allowed that his faith to grow and come out of that, which gave him strength, which means that he has victory. Why? Because he that full circle, right? I buffet my body. Why? Because I'm all in, he says. I take every thought captive. Why? Because I'm all in. Forgetting what lies behind, I press forward. Why? Because I'm all in, right? And so this is the thing that you and I have to look at. So I'm just going to leave you with these thoughts because these are the thoughts I've been wrestling with. You and I have to be brutal with our sin, big or small. Big or small. White lie, if no such thing, right? Little sin, didn't hurt anybody. No, no, it's an offense to a holy God. That's why John writes, I write these things to you, my children, that you do not sin. That's the most daunting verse in all the scriptures. Like that's a possibility that I don't sin? John wrote like it was. I'm not claiming that I'll ever arrive there. But John says, I write this so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, know that you have an advocate before the Father. Let's just let that sink in. We, let's, let's don't normalize ourselves and go, oh, everybody sins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but God has re- removed the penalty of that sin and the power of that sin. The choice was mine to sin. Let's make better choices, Right? I'm not being brutal. I'm, I mean, I'm in the boat with you guys. Mm-hmm. What area in your life have you not entrusted to the Lord? 
Are there certain things you just go, I'm just going to give it to the Lord, right? Right? How about your family? Whatever's going on there, whatever that stuff is. How about your friends? How about your finances, your work? What Pick it. Is there any area of your life you haven't gone, hey, today, Lord, I'm giving this to you? That should be something you do every day. And then the last one is just what sins are you holding on to? What are those trigger sins that, you know, where, where Hebrew says, let us lay aside the, the sin that so easily entangles us? That definite article there is meant to be unique. It means not, there's not a sin, there's the sin for you, right? Whatever that one is, right? Let us lay aside the sin that owns you so that we may run the race. So you ought to wrestle with that question. What sin is it that, I'm, that I got that it seems like it just keeps coming back in my face? No matter how many times I put it down, that's the one, right? Let's be bulldogged about that. Let's be Caleb, right? Let's yeah. do that. No. I got a good old song for us to sing. It's a hymn. His faithfulness. Michael's going to go ahead. Michael, you can go ahead and serve us too if you want to while we're singing this song.